Welcome or welcome back to the company of the cat. Hi. Today I want to talk about Targaryen madness. I touched on it briefly in my Visenya video, but let's dive deeper. I will analyze why it's not exactly madness and definitely isn't hereditary. We'll discuss individuals considered unstable, why that happened, and its importance to the current timeline. A clue to understanding the dragon has three heads. If you enjoy my content, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And without further ado, let's go. According to some beliefs, House Targaryen carries the taint of insanity in its bloodline, often referred to as Targaryen madness. The closest to confirmation we have is what Zaharis II said. King Zaharis once told me that madness and greatness were two sides of the same coin. Every time a new Targaryen is born, he said, the gods toss the coin in the air and the world holds its breath to see how it will land. Statistically speaking, <laughs> we only have a few confirmed cases of madness and not every confirmed case displays the same characteristics. Baylor I, Rhaegel, Arion, Aerys II and Viserys certainly did not have the same issues, even though it is very clear none of them was very stable. Between the Targaryen kings who ruled Westeros for almost 300 years, only Aerys could be considered truly mad. And another person as well, whom I will talk about later. Several princes and bastards of Targaryen blood have done some crazy things for one reason or another, but it was not madness, but desperate or arrogant acts that led to serious tragedies such as Hammerhall. I will be that person and say that if we take 300 years of ruling kings around Westeros, we will find many people that did some crazy ass shit, it isn't that unusual and definitely not exclusive to the Targaryens. That being said, the mad people we have in this bloodline do have a common characteristic, aside from them being men, and that is that most of them had prophetic dreams. This is what separates them from other houses. Dreams and visions can affect someone's sanity, as we have seen way too many times. Pat's face has prophetic dreams and is not mentally stable. Aaron is also considered half mad. In the House of the Undying, the description we get is that of a maze. We see similar descriptions in the mazes in Lorath, where again you go so you can see the truth and visions. We also have underground mazes in Leng, where the very few who go and come out are brave and mad. And of course they told Dani to not look through the doors she was not supposed to look at because it is dangerous. Jenny of freaking old stones was considered both half mad and a witch by the locals, so she most likely had dreams and was also associated to the ghost of Highheart, who for sure has prophetic dreams, as we saw from Arya's POVs. So the madness is not a Targaryen trait per se, but peoples with prophetic dreams in general. It's just that the Targaryens do indeed have many members with visions since they have magical blood. As I mentioned before in my Visenya video, one thing all the mad Targaryens have in common is actually their gender. All of them are men. The closest to mad Targaryen women we have are Helena and Elora, and they were not mad in the way Aerys and Arion were. They were very well liked, polite, they were described as mad in fire and blood because both of them were present in some very tragic events. Both are described as going mad from grief. We do not know whether Elora had dreams, but since the dreams plotline in House of the Dragon came from Martin and will come in the books as well, there is a huge possibility Helena was a dreamer. Even in this scenario, Helena was kinda moony and aloof, but again, not mad in the way many people say Targaryen madness is presented in the members, and there is a big reason for that. The way they translated this stupid prophecy. <laughs> it was a dream. And just as Danis foresaw the end of Valyria, Aegon foresaw the end of the world of men. It is to begin with a terrible winter, gusting out of the distant north. I, Rickon Stark, Lord of Winterfell. Aegon saw Lord absolute Winterfell. darkness riding on those winds. And whatever dwells within will destroy the world of the living. When this great winter comes, Munira, all of Westeros must stand against it. And if the world of men is to survive, a Targaryen must be seated on the Iron Throne. A king or queen, strong enough to unite the realm against the cold and the dark. Aegon called his dream the Song of Ice and Fire. This secret being passed from king to heir since Aegon's time. This is what Viserys said, vaguely what was said to him by Zaharis, I imagine. The dagger glyphs are translated to from my blood come the prince that was promised and his will be the song of ice and fire. A translation we know for a fact isn't correct and is also the prophecy Maester Aemon and Rhaegar found from what I understand. No one ever looked for a girl. It was a prince that was promised, not a princess. Rhaegar, I thought. The smoke was from the fire that devoured Summerhall on the day of his birth. The salt from the tears said, for those who died. He said my belief when he was young, but later he became persuaded that it was his own son who fulfilled this prophecy. 
for a comet had been seen above King's Landing on the night Aegon was conceived, and Rhaegar was certain the bleeding star had to be a comet. What fools we were who thought ourselves so wise. The error crept in from the translation. Dragons are neither male nor female, but saw the truth of that. But now one, and now the other. As changeable as flame. The language misled us all for a thousand years. Apparently, the inscription and the Valyrian prophecy Rhaegar found before he decided to become a warrior talks about a dragon without stating the sex, because dragons do not have distinct sexes. The species doesn't have two sexes according to Barth, and Aemon and Targaryens themselves cannot distinguish a dragon's sex. Some of them just birth eggs, and are said to be female because of that. From what I understand, dragons are similar to the New Mexico Whiptail Lizard. From the way Aemon explained the whole situation, the translation must be closer to From my blood come the dragon that was promised, and theirs will be the Song of Ice and Fire. So not only does the prophecy itself not talk about a prince per se, but it is also altered a bit every time someone repeats it or has similar dreams that they interpret as they themselves think best. The translations or interpretations of this prophecy are not correct and we see the word prince in the common tongue because it was supposed to pass from ruler to ruler and since they were following the under law, the successor was a man. But nowhere in the prophecy do we see a man, only a dragon. Men were way more invested and obsessive and in time they would turn mad because they believed it was a prince that was promised. So of course if they had the dreams or they were the ones who found the Valyrian inscriptions, they thought they were the chosen ones. We see it with other people in the current storyline as well. Mel is obsessed with the idea of Stannis being Azor Ahai and Euron thinks he is also the chosen one because most people when they have dreams and visions think, oh, of course this is me. Or in the case of Mel, I think it is this, and I love my god, so no way the god is misleading me. But as readers, we see what they have visions about, and most of them than not, are vague things that could be about anyone. About the Targaryens specifically, it is so obvious that most started to think themselves as the prince the moment the dragons died out. The dragons died, and so many of those who saw these dreams specifically were sure they're gonna be the prince. So when they were not, and things didn't go as expected, they would start to go mad, because things didn't align with what they were sure was the case. And on top of that, many of them would have been some serious trauma, such as wars and battles, deaths of loved ones. Many people had these dreams, but not all of them became freaking psychopaths like Arion or Ares. It isn't a blood taint or hereditary madness, it's that some of them were shitty people from the start, like countless other people in the story, Targaryens and non-Targaryens, and of course, when they were exposed to these dreams, their ego, as well as their paranoia and anger, grew and they started to become mentally unstable. And it is very easy to see this if we look at the people who are considered mad. Baylor was not okay, but Baylor was never a bad person. So of course, even though insane, he was never violent or cruel. I want to talk about all the members that were not mentally stable and what exactly they saw in their dreams. And I'm going to start with Arion Targaryen. Arion was the second son of Makar and the brother of Daeron, Aemon, Dela, Aegon V, the Egg, and Rey. Arion, even when younger, wasn't very okay. From the information we get about him, Arion walked so Euron could run. Arion was despised by his younger brother Egg, who considered him a liar. According to Raymond Fosway, the prince was all smiles and curses in front of his father, but his true nature showed in front of others. His brother Daeron also thought of him as quite the monster. From Aegon, we get two pieces of information that were very concerning. Arion threw Aegon's pet cat down a well, though he claimed otherwise, and he also visited Aegon in his bedroom during the night, put a knife to Aegon's privates, and joked about removing his genitals so Aegon would become a sister he could marry. Arion was also very arrogant, handsome, and liked to sleep around a lot, and was easy to anger as well. According to Maester Aemon, all the brothers had dreams. We do not know about Dela and Ray, but the brothers, it is stated explicitly in A Fish for Crows, had dreams. The last dragon died before you were born, said Sam. How could you remember them? I see them in my dream, Sam. I see a red star bleeding in the sky. I still remember red. I see their shadows on the snow. I hear the cracks of leathern wings. Feel their hot breath. My brothers dreamed of dragons too. And the dreams killed them. Everyone. Sam. We tremble on the cusps of half-remembered prophecies of wonders and terrors that no man now living could hope to comprehend, or... Or? said Sam. Or not, Aemon chuckled softly. Here pretty much we see what I said before. Some can handle these dreams and these prophecies, but others can't. We also see that they definitely see dragons. All of them see dragons. 
Amon, Daron the Drunken, Daenerys, etc. Daron was also never that mentally stable. But he was not considered mad, but a drunk. The thing is that he was drinking because he had these dreams and couldn't handle them. And alcoholism is partly a mental illness as well. Across the room, the lordling raised his head from the wine puddle. His face had a shallow and healthy cast to it beneath a rat's nest of sandy brown hair, and blonde stubble crushed his chin. He rubbed his mouth, blinked at Duncan, and said, I dreamed of you. His hand trembled as he pointed a finger. You stay away from me, do you hear me? You stay well away. Dunk stared at him as suddenly, my lord. Never you mind that one, sir. All he does is drink and talk about his dreams. Daron saw Dunk and said stay away because in his dream he saw Dunk and a dead dragon. So he thought that Dunk would kill him. I dreamt of you, said the prince. You said that at the inn. Did I? Well, it's so. My dreams are not like yours, said Duncan. Mine are true. They frighten me. You frighten me. I dreamt of you and a dead dragon, you see, a great beast, huge with wings so large they could cover this meadow. It had fallen on top of you, but you were alive and the dragon was dead. Did I kill it? That I could not say. But you were there and so was the dragon. We were the masters of dragons once, we Targaryens. Now they are all gone, but we remain. I don't care to die today. The gods alone know why, but I don't. So do me a kindness, if you would, and make certain it is my brother Arion you slay. The dream is very, very vague. And we know that because we learned exactly what it was about when we saw the trial. Once Sir Robin unhorsed him, he lay where he fell. He may have a broken foot. His own horse trod on him while running loose about the field. Dazed and confused as he was, Dunk felt a huge sense of relief. His dream was wrong then, the dead dragon, unless Arion died. He didn't though, did he? No, said Egg. You spared him, don't you remember? Here Dunk tried to remember what had happened, and we see what actually happened and how this dream came to be fulfilled. A tall knight stood above him in black armor, didn't and scarred by many blows. Prince Baylor, the scarlet dragon on his helm had lost a head, both wings, and most of its tail. Your grace, Dunk said, I am your man, please, your man. My man, the black knight put a hand on Raymond's shoulder to steady himself. I need good men, Sir Duncan, the realm. His voice sounded only slurred. Perhaps he'd bit his tongue. Dan was very tired. It was hard to stay awake. Your man, he murmured once more. The prince moved his head slowly from side to side. Raymond, my helm, if you'd be so kind. Visor, visors cracked and my fingers, fingers feel like wood. At once, your grace. Raymond took the prince's helm in both hands and granted. Go down, pay the hand. Stilly pay dragged over a mounting stool. It's crashed down at the back, your grace, towards the left side. Smashed into the gorget. Good still this, to stop such a blow. Brother's mace, most like, Baylor said thickly. He is strong, he winced. That feels queer, I... Here it comes. Pate lifted the battered helm away. Gods be good. O oh gods, O oh gods, O oh gods preserve. Dunk saw something red and wet fall out of the helm. Someone was screaming, high and terrible. Against the bleak grey sky, swayed a tall, tall prince in black armor with only half a skull. He could see red blood and pale bone beneath and something else, something blue-gray and pulpy. A queer troubled look passed across Baylor's Breakspear's face, like a cloud passing before the sun. He raised his hand and touched the back of his head with two fingers, oh so lightly. And then he fell. Dunk caught him. Up, they say, he said, just as he had with thunder in the melee. Up, up. But he never remembered that afterward, and the priest did not rise. The reason I put this dream here is that it is the best example in the whole series for us to see what they were seeing and how these events actually happened, along with what they believed would happen. If Daron was not the chill drunk guy that he was and was an Arion type person, he would have killed Dunk on the spot. Arion also thinks that all the dreams he had were about himself. Apart from Aemon saying all of us had dreams, Daron also said Arion's quite the monster. He thinks he is a dragon in human form, you know, that's why he was so wroth at the puppet show. A pity he wasn't born a false way. Then he think himself an apple and we'll all be a deal safer. But there you are. Arion had dragon dreams and was sure that the dragons were him. And because he was a terrible human from the start, he started to go down the road we know. We do not know exactly what he was seeing, but I can guess, and I'm fairly sure about at least one of his dreams. He drank wildfire because he had dreams about Danny's pyre. Nine mages crossed the sea to hatch Aegon III Cassay of Eggs. Baylor the Blessed prayed over his for half a year. Aegon IV built dragons of wood and iron. Arion Brightflame drank wildfire to transform himself. The mages failed, King Baylor's prayer went unanswered, the wooden dragons burned, and Prince Arion died screaming. Arion Brightflame's son was born in 232 AC and given the ominous name of Magor by his sire. 
But the Bright Prince himself died the same year when he drank a cup of wildfire in the belief that it would allow him to transform himself into a dragon. This conversation in the Davos chapter happened when they wanted to sacrifice Edric so they could wake dragons from stone like others tried to do. Another clue that following these stupid prophecies never works out. Our Duderion, apart from being an asshole, was also extremely arrogant. From what I understand, his dream was a human burning in a huge fire, not dying, and out of the pyre, emerging dragons. Which is exactly what happened with Danny. She walked into a huge pyre, didn't die, and hatched the eggs. He translated to him transforming into a dragon and thought, oh, big fire, something that burns a lot, let's try wildfire, which is also called dragon breath. But that obviously didn't work. And I'm fairly sure this was the case because he waited to have a kid to do that for some reason. Considering that Rago played a role in Danny's fire, I think he was waiting for that. Even before he had this kid, we know that he was sleeping around in Lys and probably had bastards. And when younger, he wanted to make Aegon a sister so they could marry, which, ew. And the last reason I think Arion did see the pyre is actually Aerys, who also saw something very, very similar to that. Unlike Arion, who we know for a fact had dreams, we are not sure whether Aerys had, but some comments make it quite obvious that he did. My sworn brothers were all away, you see, but Aerys liked to keep me close. I was my father's son, so he did not trust me. He wanted me where Varys could watch me, day and night. So I heard it all. He remembered how Rosard eyes would shine when he unscrolled the maps to show where the substance must be placed. Garrigus and Baelis were the same. Rhaegar met Robert on the trident and you know what happened there. When the world reached court, Aerys packed the Queen of the Dragonstone with Prince Viserys. Princess Elia would have gone as well, but he forbade it. Somehow he had gotten it in his head that Prince Lewin must have betrayed Rhaegar on the trident. But he thought he could keep Dorne loyal so long as he kept Elia and Aegon by his side. Let Robert be king over charred bones and cooked meat. The Targaryens never bury their dead, they burn them. Aerys meant to have the greatest funeral pyre of them all, though if truth be told, I do not believe he truly expected to die. Like Aerion Brightflame before, Aerys thought the fire would transform him, that he would rise again, reborn as a dragon, and turn all his enemies to ash. Not only we get a direct parallel to Aerion, but Aerys was very similar in character to him, even before his captivity during the defiance of Duskendale. Aerys was handsome and could be charming when he wanted to be, he loved her maidens and took multiple mistresses. At the same time, he wasn't the smartest person or the most diligent. He was quick to anger, vain, proud, changeable, and easy to flatter. With time, Mary started to have more and more mood swings, and his behavior grew increasingly erratic. He became more and more jealous, suspicious, and violent as the years went on, and was prone to furious outbursts. So we can see that the signs about him were there. He wasn't the best person and with time he started to become progressively worse, especially after his captivity. From the previous quote, to me at least, it is very easy to pick up that he had dreams and these dreams made the situation worse. First of all, the whole his pyre would be the biggest and will transform into a dragon makes it obvious that he was also seeing the pyre. A human in the pyre and a dragon coming out of the flames. Secondly, I think that he was seeing his death and the fact that people would betray him. He says that he wanted to have Jaime with him all the time and had Varys watching him, and he didn't trust Tywin either, along with everything else. So I think that he was seeing lions betray him or something. It looks to me like a vicious circle. An already egotistical, vain, proud, and quick to anger person, all in all, not the best dude, had dreams, So he started to take actions in order to prevent these dreams from happening or to make some of these dreams come true, leading to the exact result he wanted to avoid. He was becoming more and more paranoid and mentally unstable, giving people actual reasons to betray him and eventually kill him. But the thing is that Ares was an asshole since the beginning. And also we do not know what happened during his captivity exactly, but it's not like his personality actually changed. Viserys was displaying the same problematic characteristics as Ares, not because he was his son, but because he grew up with him during his worst era. Pariston clearly stated that Viserys, even when young, was showing the same attributes as Ares. I wouldn't find it strange if Ares used to talk about waking dragons or transforming into ones to young Viserys, considering that Viserys, when angry, used the phrase, you do not want to wake the dragon, frequently. Maybe he even informed him of these dreams and how he was the prince, Or even maybe Viserys himself also had dreams about dragons waking, since we saw this phrase before Daenerys' fire. And with the dream continuing, the phrase progressively was transforming into wake the dragon. 
In any case, we see that upbringing plays the largest role and the problem with him was not the fact that he was a Targaryen, but the fact that as a young impressionable kid, he used to spend the majority of his time with Aerys. And since day one, people told him how important he is and how he is going to become the next king, as well as being salty with her later situation in Essos. Baylor, for example, didn't have any of the attributes of Aerys, Arion or Viserys, even though it is 100% obvious that the guy was not mentally stable. I have seen people blame it on the Vipers that beat him in Dorne, but let's be honest here for a moment. He was doing some really crazy stuff, which is why the Vipers beat him in the first place. He thought of himself as blessed by the Seven and Holy before this incident, so I'm fairly sure that this wasn't the case. He was aloof and moon even before, considering that he thought walking barefoot all the way to Dorne and walking through a pit of vipers to save Aemon was safe because he felt the gods would protect him. Again, the signs were already there, extremely pious, and a martyr saint Baylor was very much a thing since he was 17, if not younger, and his declining mental health was not the result of the venom. Yes, it probably made it worse, but it didn't cause it. Now, Baylor also had dreams, for sure. He was talking about them, it's just that people didn't believe him. <laughs> Baylor grew up extremely devout, so his approach to these dreams was vastly different than the typical one. Baylor was peaceful, very devout and pious. He preached purity and unlike the other people we talked about, he had the Jesus syndrome. He had to make sacrifices for his people. It was his duty as a king and as a man of God. Baylor was trying to be good, benevolent, forgiving and caring toward his subject, thus he was so loved by the small folk. The thing is, the lords and the council weren't as fond of his actions and considered him a very, very weak ruler. That being said, it is obvious that Baylor thought of himself as the chosen one, and the biggest clue is his extreme focus on staying a virgin and not having kids himself. If someone from your bloodline will be the prince that was promised, and the line stops with you, then you will be the prince, since the prophecy does not lie. It's clear that the whole situation with the Maiden Vault happened for this exact reason, as well as the fact that he valued purity in general, especially in women, because he was extremely devout. There is an amazing video that I already recommended on my Visenya one, by Crowfoot's daughter about Baylor, that states these thoughts exactly. That Baylor made the Maiden Vault because of his dreams. As a young boy, the Prince of Dragonstone was bookish to a fault. He was reading so early that men said Queen Rayla must have swallowed some books and a candle whilst he was in her womb. Rhaegar took no interest in the play of other children. The maesters were awed by his wits, but his father's knight would just surely that Baylor the Blessed had been born again. It seems like Baylor was bookish to a fault, and if Rhaegar found this prophecy in a scroll, then easily Baylor could have found the prophecy in a similar manner as well, if at that point it was already lost. Even in this part, they talk about Rhaegar and his very abrupt shift, something that we later learned from Aemon, happened because Rhaegar found this prophecy. Rhaegar, though, at some point started to shift his mind about he himself being the prince to his son being the chosen one instead. Unlike him, Baylor seemed very persistent on not having kids, and he indeed tried to hatch dragons. So I'm pretty sure he had found the scrolls and thought of himself as the chosen. Baylor was very much aware of various books too, he had read them and decided to burn many of them, since they didn't line up with his opinions. We know he burned the testimony of Mushroom by Mushroom, and Dragons, Worms and Wyverns, their unnatural history by Septon Barth, because he claimed Barth was more of a sorcerer than a Septon. Thing is, that from the very little stuff we know about Barth, he was spot on for many things, so Baylor saw something in this book that he didn't like and burned it. Baylor did try to hatch eggs. For half a year he was trying to achieve this by praying over his egg, but he failed. From the way he spoke about Barth, he obviously didn't agree with him because he was someone who at the very least understood magic, and he might even have been delving into some. Hatching dragons, at least hatching them for the first time, when there are no other dragons around, needs magic. It's a whole ritual, and in his books, Barth talked about dragons and how their birth and creation are not completely natural. From what I understand, Baylor was of the opinion that it has to do with God. Living pure, be the chosen one of the gods, and you will be successful. But spoiler alert, he wasn't, and of course it didn't work. He himself said that he decided to build the Great Sept on Visenya's Hill specifically because he saw it in a vision. Now, what is it that he saw and decided to do that, we do not know. We also don't know what happened to the Grand Sept atop the hill from Aegon the Conqueror's reign, but I'm gonna bet that Maegor happened. In any case, <laughs> Baylor had a vision, and from other things he said and did, it is obvious he had dreams and visions. 
He also made two very random people's septons. The first one paid, could curve stonework so beautifully that Baylor believed him to be the smith in human form. The next one was a lowborn kid, whom Baylor claimed he saw perform miracles. Apparently the boy spoke to doves and they answered him back in the voice of the gods. No one ever saw the boy perform any miracles, but considering that Baylor had visions and dreams, he most likely did see something in them. An eight-year-old who speaks to birds that answer back in the voices of the gods sounds a lot like Bran. He said doves and not ravens or crows, but he also tried to replace messenger ravens with doves. And considering how vague these dreams are, I doubt he saw the exact species of the bird. He most likely just saw white birds. And there are white ravens that signify the coming of winter. It could also be symbolic of the white as bone weirwoods speaking through the ravens. He for sure was seeing something about Bran and winter and dragons coming to life. He just tried to make these dreams come true in a very wacky way <laughs> because he was very, very devout. During the end of his life, he was fasting, especially after his sister Dana gave birth to Damon Blackfire and Nerys twins died quickly after their birth. Baylor fasted for 40 days and nights, refusing to take anything but water and some bread and on the 41st day of his fast, he collapsed, and neither Grand Master Mungan nor the boy High Septon could save him. Some say Baylor starved himself to death by prolonged fasting to cleanse himself of lust. Others believe he was poisoned by his hand and ankle, Viserys. To be honest, I think it's the first one. He was trying very, very hard to remain a virgin and not have kids for some reason. So it stands to reason that if he had started to get lustful thoughts, he would do whatever he could to get rid of them. All in all, Baylor too was fixated on the same damn prophecy and had dreams that included white birds and a boy talking to them and the gods, as well as dragons, meaning he saw a summary of a Game of Thrones. <laughs> Another mentally unstable person we know of was Regal, the son of Daron the Good. We know very limited information about him, but from what I understand, he also was a non-violent and stable Targaryen. Apart from being meek and sickly and having been seen dancing naked, through the Red Keep, we don't know anything else. Considering his mental and physical health, it is possible he also had some dreams, but we don't really know and I don't think it matters. If he had, the only person these dreams affected was himself. Now, Maegor is someone who didn't have the reputation of being mad, but cruel. Something I find very weird, considering he wasn't that different from Eris, especially after his one-month-long coma. I'm not gonna get into detail about him, since the Visenya video was partly about him as well. In summary, I said I believe that either Visenya had the dream, or it was indeed Aegon's dream, and Visenya was the one fixated on it. Aenys, meaning the oldest son of Aegon, the one who would continue the line, was not her child, and there was also a rumor that he was a bastard of Rhaenys with another man as well. The error crept in from the translation. The dagger says, from my blood would come, blah blah blah. All three siblings had the same blood. They had the same parents and grandparents and so on. It doesn't matter who the person is going to be as long as one of these three was one of the parents. It doesn't matter whether Aenys was or wasn't Aegon's kid because his mother was Rhaenys and she had the same blood as Visenya and Aegon. So either Visenya had the dream, as I think was the case, and interpreted this dream as my kid had to continue the line, or it was indeed Aegon's dream, and Visenya was the one fixated on making Megor the king because she was the one focused on magic and was sure her son was 100% Aegon's kid. I believe that these two are the most possible scenarios because they explain everything that went down with Megor. Visenya did whatever she could to produce a kid herself. She did everything she could, even bringing a witch from Pentos to heal him from a coma, and both she and Megor tried everything so Megor could have kids and continue the line. Both were very much aware of this prophecy and wanted to make it come true, leading Megor down the path we know. Megor was very straightforward and had anger outbursts since he was a kid, but after his coma, he really started to go down the Ares path. He was as paranoid as Ares and did cruel things to people, even to innocent ones, like the builders, because he was so sure that everyone was out to get him, giving valid reasons for people to ditch him, even to people who were on his side at first. So yeah, personally, I don't think that Megor was that stable after his coma. I also think that he was very much aware of the prophecy, thus he did all the things he did. That being said, Megor was always very easy to anger, was also kind of spoiled and egotistical as a kid, and very impulsive, which is not the best combination. So we can see the madness doesn't have anything to do with the bloodline and most definitely is not hereditary. It has to do with the personality of the family members and what they decide to do with these dreams. Dennis the Dreamer was very much stable from what we know and was 
invested in visions in general since he had written a book as well, which is now mostly lost. Maester Aemon was also very much a person that his dreams didn't affect him, even though he said that, yes, sometimes it is hard, and not everyone is strong enough to not be affected by them. I don't think Egg and Rhaegar were obsessed with the prophecies last dream in the same way others were. They look very much normal and mentally stable, but they were overconfident in believing they could do it. Egg in general, even though not a fan favorite to the lords, was loved by the small folk since he had lived among them while squaring for Duncan the Tall, and passed many laws that protected them as well. Egg was very much aware of the dream and the prophecy since he was a kid, and he himself had dreams while older. Someday, the dragons will return. My brother Daron's dreamed of it. And King Eris read it in a prophecy. Maybe it will be my egg that hatches. That would be splendid. One of the reasons he wanted to bring new dragons was that he believed only with dragons the Lords of the Seven Kingdoms would accept degrees that granted freedom, rights, and protections to the small folk. And he was not wrong, since Eris and Tywin removed them when they came into power. <laughs> in the last years of his reign, Egg was searching for ancient lore about the dragon breeding of Valyria, and it was said that Aegon commissioned journeys to places as far away as Asai, with the hopes of finding tests and knowledge that had not been preserved in Westeros. He did research, he didn't just try to hatch them like others did, he tried to have everything down and be prepared, maesters and pyromarchers were there as well, and in general, they were overconfident about it, but it didn't work. Definitely not mad though. Rhaegar was kinda similar. He found this prophecy while reading some scrolls and was sure that he was the prince. Thus he had to become a warrior and Maester Aemon also believed that. But after some time, Rhaegar started to think that it was about his son and not about himself. At this point, I have to say something. For some reason, it is a very popular theory that Rhaegar went for Lyanna so he could have a third child because the dragon must have three heads. But I don't think this is the case. In the whole history of the family after Aegon, all of them were searching for one prince. The prophecy was for one Targaryen, and it is obvious that Rhaegar was pretty much the same. In Danny's vision, it is like he is talking to her and looking at her. Let's not forget that this is a vision, we don't know if this is exactly how it happened. The way this scene plays out looks to me more like a hint about Danny, a warning, something that all the previous Targaryens were missing, that they need three components. Viserys was her first thought the next time she paused, but a second glance told her otherwise the man had her brother's hair, but he was taller, and his eyes were a dark indigo rather than lilac. Aegon he said to a woman nursing a newborn babe in the great wooden bed. What better name for a king? Will you make a song for him? The woman asked. He has a song, the man replied. He is the prince that was promised, and his is the song of ice and fire. He looked up when he said it, and his eyes met Danny's, and it seems as if he saw her standing there beyond the door. There must be one more, he said. Though whether he was speaking to her or the woman in the bed, she could not say. The dragon has three heads. He went to the window seat, picked up a harp, and ran his finger lightly over his silvery strings. Sweet sadness filled the room as man and wife and babe faded like the morning mist. Only the music lingered behind to speed her on her way. Now, it doesn't matter what your opinion is on Rhaegar and Lyanna, to be honest. George calls Rhaegar straight up a lovestruck prince, and we are missing a bunch of information on what actually happened. I believe it's more probable that Rhaegar was thinking, oh... We have the prince, I did my duty, I am gonna follow my heart now, or something similar, and went with Lyanna. Aemon said that Rhaegar was sure Aegon was the prince, and in the vision he does indeed call him the prince and says that his song would be the song of ice and fire. And then he looks at Dany and says there must be one more and the dragon must have three heads. This scene takes place right before Dany enters the last room to meet with the Undying, so the, there must be one more could be about more than one thing and not just about another baby. I am not convinced that he wanted to recreate the three heads and I think it was a vision of the past along with various symbolisms involved like most visions. Rhaegar's arc especially was that he thought of himself and later Aegon as the prince, one person, and we have seen various visions and none of them is a straightforward so I doubt this one was. So again, I think Rhaegar was in the same category as Aegon. I have the dreams last found the prophecy so I'm gonna do what I have to do because it's about me. None of them were insane, just overconfident, kinda self-centered, and in some instances thick as well, because they were sure they knew the meanings behind the things they saw slash found. And they followed them verbatim, and of course it didn't work. So looking at this, we can easily see that Mad Queen Danny is a very stupid plot point. <laughs> 
Sorry, not sorry. It is just a bad plot point that doesn't fit with the majority of the things written about here in the novels. Daenerys has dreams and people give her prophecies and riddles like every two days and she never spends all her time thinking about them. She had gotten a bunch of information from them, but she doesn't decide what to do based on a dream she had two years ago. She always decides what to do when it is time to make a decision. She never displayed the personality traits many of them had from the start, and all in all, if George wanted to go down that road, he had five books to build it, but he didn't. I said it in my Daenerys analysis video, it doesn't matter whether you agree with what she is doing, even though I personally couldn't give two craps about the dead slavers. Her storyline is that sadly you cannot accommodate everyone, and when you try to rule, you need to take harsh decisions and you will have blood on your hands. Both John and Daenerys learned that the hard way. Daenerys will burn Volantis, she will bear the slaver cities, and the slaves are backing her up and waiting for her, as we saw in various passages in Dance, in Tyrion's and Barristan's POVs. And whoever thinks that after his resurrection Jon will be as lenient as he has been so far, I think they will be disappointed. Jon's and Danny's storylines in Dance are almost a carbon copy of each other, for a reason, because their storylines lead to the same place, but through opposite directions. I had an innocence in him, a sweetness we all loved. Kill the boy within you, I told him the day I took the ship for the wall. It takes a man to rule. An Aegon, not an egg. Kill the boy and let the man be born. By the way, <laughs> I have to say that I find it very funny that people who say that these are proof of Danny's upcoming evilness and madness and that the show's ending is semi-canon are the same people who clapped and cheered when John hanged the kid without thinking that in the kid's mind stabbing John was the right thing to do. He didn't have a reason to like any of the wildlings or John who let them pass, considering that the wildlings burned and pillaged his home. Just saying that if we are going there and taking into consideration stuff from a bad TV series adaptation that has zero basis in the books, then we have to apply them everywhere because so far all of our main leads, all five of them, do very unsavory things if needed, with Tyrion being the worst. All in all, I am waiting for both Danny's and John's return so they can put some people in their places. Now, Daenerys will arrive in Westeros quite late in the game and will most likely find King's Landing already burned by John Con and Cersei, who both have a shit on of foreshadowing regarding that, and a Euron causing havoc. If dragon burning is involved, it will happen at the Ritz, because Euron. In any case, this deserves a different video, let's focus on the fact that whether you agree or not with what Daenerys is doing, the Mad Queen plotline is very, very stupid <laughs> and doesn't make sense with the narrative. Also, the plotline is already assigned to three other characters, Cersei, Stannis and Euron. These three are the people who do exactly what all the Targaryens I mentioned above were doing. Cersei is thinking of the prophecies she got as a girl very, very often and tries to stop it. Euron is drinking shade to have visions and does what he sees in these visions, thinking that they are an instruction manual. And Stannis has been paralleled twice to people like Baelor, Aerion, Aegon IV and Thief. Mel is convinced that she is Azor Ahai and what she is actually seeing in these visions doesn't matter. She translates them in a way to fit hers and Stannis' narrative, even though it is painfully obvious that this is gonna be their downfall. Looking at the people who fail to interpret this prophecy, we as reader can understand what this prophecy means and why all these people failed, why Cersei, Euron, Stannis and Mel are walking down that path and why our heroes don't. But most importantly, we understand that the dragon has three heads is not about three Targaryen people. And both Rhaegar in Danny's vision and Maester Raymond understood that way too late, I think. Rhaegar after his death and Daemon close to his own. That had been one of his last good days. After that, the old man spent more time sleeping than awake, curled up beneath a pile of furs in the captain's cabin. Sometimes he would mutter in his sleep. When he woke, he called for Sam, insisting that he had to tell him something. But of us not, he would have forgotten what he meant to say by the time Sam arrived. Even when he did recall, his talk was all a jumble. He spoke of dreams and never named the dreamer of a glass candle that could not be lit and eggs that could not hatch. He said the Sphinx was the riddle, not the riddler, whatever that meant. He asked Sam to read for him from a book by Septon Barth, whose writing has been burned during the reign of Baylor the Blessed. Once he woke up weeping, the dragon must have three heads, he wailed. But I am too old and frail to be one of them. I should be with her, showing her the way, but my body had betrayed me. The Sphinx is the riddle, not the riddler. So let's look what Alera's the Sphinx said in the prologue of the same book. The tales are not the same, instated Armen. Dragons in Asai, dragons in Karth, dragons in Mirin, Dothraki dragons, dragons free in slaves. Its telling differs from the last, only in detail. Molander grew more stubborn when he drank, and even when sober he was bullheaded. All speak of dragons and the beautiful young queen. One last apple, promised Alaris, and I will tell you what I suspect about these dragons. What could you know that I don't? grumbled Molander. 
Despite an Ablona branch jumped up, pulled it down and threw. The dragon has three heads. He announced in his soft dornish troll. Is this a riddle? Sphinx is always speaking riddles in the tales. No riddle, Alera sipped his wine. It has been Lazy Leo who dubbed Alera's the Sphinx. A Sphinx is a bit of this, a bit of that. A human face, the body of a lion, the wings of a hawk. Alera's was the same. His father was a Dornish man, his mother a black-skinned summer islander. His own skin was dark as thick. And like the green marble sphinxes that flank the citadel's main gate, Alera's had eyes of onyx. The dragon has three heads is the riddle, but the riddle is the sphinx, and the sphinx is a little bit of this and a little bit of that. The dragon with the three heads is a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Azura High is not one person and also doesn't mean that all of them must be a Targaryen. Black and white, fire and ice, dusk and dawn, light and dark, we just need balance. If I had to choose the three heads, I am gonna say Danny, John and Bran. Danny is the fire, John is the ice, and Bran is nature, the neutral element. Danny didn't die in the pyre when she should have. She brought the fire, which according to Martin is about life. John is a Stark, I have said it before, his other half matters to him, but as far as the magical plotline of the series goes, I doubt it would matter that his father is most likely Rhaegar and he is half Targaryen. He is a Stark through and through. He already has a direwolf that is actually a weirwood colored one, that is constantly linked to the trees and can skin change to the other direwolves. John has the eyes in his blood and like Brynden Rivers, another Targaryen bastard, in the grand scheme of things and the magical issue, only his mother's bloodline plays a role. He is a green seer, he is the blood raven, he is a blackwood. I don't really see the point of the mother's blood mattering less, considering that we see very often that it matters as much, if not more sometimes. Lastly, John died and his whole storyline is connected to death and ice. Bran is the middle ground. He is connected to nature. He can fly but cannot walk. He is a kid but knows the past. He is a summer child and he must live because winter is coming. He was touched by death but he is alive. Every song must have its balance and in this song the balance is Bran. Only summer, eternal life and fire is bad, yes, but only death, darkened eyes is as bad. You need both and both are important and none is inherently evil. I think I'm gonna finish this video here because I think I've been talking for ages at this point. <laughs> Write your thoughts and theories and whatever else you want to talk about in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And until the next one, bye!